Welcome to this bonus episode of Tied to the Moon for the winter solstice in 2022. It is very dark. I looked up from the fire last night at half past five and everything was was black outside. So it is that time of returning inwards and becoming quieter and slower and more insular, more sedentary, more reflective. These are the things I will take with me into the coming months of the winter season. For the last two episodes of Tied to the Moon, we've heard the story of Joan of Arc. And at the risk of being totally repetitive, in this episode, we're going to hear exactly the same story, but all together in one episode. So you can listen all the way through and you don't need to jump around. I did want to re-record part one because it was done on a fairly scrappy microphone, but I'm having serious recording issue problems today and it's driving me bananas. And so we'll just go with the original recording and I'll stitch the two together. So you will notice at one point, I think, an improved quality of the audio in the second half. Enjoy. I was 13 when I first heard a voice from God for my help and guidance. When I first heard the voice, I was frightened. I was in the garden. It was high summer, and the voice came from the right, from the church. By the time I was 17, two to three times a week, the voice would say to me, You must go to France. You must go to France. You must lay the siege at Orléans. You must go to Robert de Baudricourt at Vaucouleurs. He will arrange safe passage for you. So said Joan of Arc in 1431 at her trial for witchcraft and heresy. She was 19 years old. And she's referring to a time two years earlier when she was 17 years old. At that time, France was in its darkest hour. For 75 years, the English had been invading the country, seeking to conquer it and claim the French crown. For the last 20 years, the French themselves had disintegrated into civil war. There were the Burgundians who aligned with the English, led by the Duke of Burgundy, and there were the Armagnacs, led by the Duke of Orléans. The French royal family itself had splintered. In 1420, when Joan was nine, the Queen of France had signed the Treaty of Troyes with the English. And under that treaty, her daughter would marry the King of England and their heir would inherit both the French and the English crowns. That same treaty disinherited the Queen's son, Charles, and he was with the Armagnacs. Now, France is geographically divided across the middle in a great arc by the River Loire. And at the time Joan is 17, most of the territory north of the River Loire, including Paris, is held by the English and the Burgundians. And most of the territory south of the River Loire is held by the Armagnacs. And Charles, who is also known as the Dauphin, has his royal court south of the river at Chinon. A few months before Joan's 17th birthday, the English lay siege to the city of Orléans. Orléans sits on the River Loire at the most northern point of that arc. And the thinking is that if Orléans falls to the English, the gateway to an invasion of the south of France would lay open. Charles the Dauphin is like a rat in a trap. He's considering moving his court further south, maybe even going into exile. His coffers are empty and his soldiers are completely demoralised. They have been beaten time and time again. 
Now, Joan comes from a tiny village called Domremy that sits up in the far northeast of France, in a pocket of Armagnac territory completely surrounded by Burgundian territory. And in her home village, she's considered good and kind, charming, maybe charismatic, but boringly pious. But she conceals a steely determination, a strong and resolute voice, a clearly focused eye, and an unshakable faith in her God, her mission, and her role. And so at 17, she sets off heading to the nearest town where there is a captain, which is Vaucouleurs, and there she seeks an audience with Robert de Baudricourt to convince him to support her mission. And her mission, as guided by the voices she hears from God, is to see France rid of the English and to have Charles crowned the rightful king of France. Robert de Baudricourt meets her and says, Take that woman back to her father and tell him to have her beaten. Joan does not return to her father to be beaten, and a few days later she comes back to de Baudricourt. By this stage, though, because of the clarity of her vision and her strength of character, she's starting to garner support in vocaleurs, and six men say they will go with her on the long trek to Chinon, to the royal court. And so eventually Robert de Baudricourt is persuaded to support her mission to attend the royal court. Joan's hair is cut short, she dons men's clothing, she learns to ride a horse, and then her and six armed men she's just met set off on the 500-kilometre trek across mostly enemy territory. It's a miracle in itself that they make it, but they finally arrive at the royal court of Charles the Dauphin in Chinon. Now, at the royal court, they know this girl is on her way. Their only question is, is she divinely guided or is she a dupe of the devil? So they meet her and they can't tell. So Charles decides to send her further south to Poitiers, where all the religious clergy, the theologians, the learned men are gathered. And there they check her virginity, of course. It's already been checked in Chinon, and it will be checked many times in the short course of her public life. And for three weeks, she is interrogated. And they find that she's good and pious, and that there's no sign of evil in her. But they want a sign from God to show that she is truly guided by him. And so they decide to set a test, and the test is that she will be allowed to lead a siege at Orleans. And so she goes back to Chinon, and over a number of weeks she's fitted for her own armour, and she has a banner made, a banner that she will carry at the head of the army as they go into battle. It's a big white banner, and she has the words Jesus Maria painted at the top. And there's a picture of Jesus, and there's two angels, one behind each of his shoulders, and he's sitting in judgment on the world. And Joan chooses a symbol for herself, and she chooses the fleur de lis, the French flower, and has that painted on the banner. And then she spends the next few weeks learning to walk with the weight of the armour and learning to ride with it and learning to ride with the weight of the armour and carrying the banner. And then her and the army head off to Orleans. Now, Orleans was under siege by the English and the Burgundians, but they didn't have enough troops to fully surround the walled town. So it's fairly easy for Joan to get into Orleans. And she arrives there with supplies and six of her entourage. But for some confusion of reasons, the army stay on the other side of the river. And after Joan goes into the town, they about face and head back to the last staging ground where they'd spent the previous night. So Joan arrives into Orleans to a hero's welcome. They lie in the streets to catch a glimpse of the woman sent by God, sent by Charles, their rightful king, to save Orleans. They reach their hands out to touch her and she is ready to fight. But the leaders of Orleans say, it's great that you're here, very grateful, you've raised our spirits and you've brought us food, we were hungry. 
but you've only come with six more soldiers and so we're not in a much better position than we were before you arrived. And Joan says, I have been sent here on a mission from God. I've been sent by the Dauphin, the rightful king of France. I need an army. Send for the army. How can I do God's will without an army? So they sent for the army. While she's waiting, she decides to send a letter to the English. It will be wrapped around an arrow and fired across the river to where they are. She doesn't write it because she's illiterate, but she dictates it. And this is what that letter says in part. King of England and you, Duke of Bedford, who call yourself the regent of the Kingdom of France, submit yourselves to the King of Heaven. Restore to the maid sent here by God the keys of all the fine towns that you have taken and violated in France. And if you refuse to listen, I will raise a war cry greater than France has heard in a thousand years. The English fall about themselves laughing. This is hilarious. They send a message back saying, you're a trollop, go back to herding cattle. But she is having none of it. She storms up to the ramparts and she bellows at them across the River Loire. Duke of Bedford and all you Englishmen, return to your God-given country or I, Joan the Maid, will come there and kill every last one of you without mercy. And they didn't pay her any attention at all. So the Armagnac army finally comes back to Orléans. The preparations are made and they are ready to fight. And at the break of dawn, they head into battle and Joan leads the charge with her banner held high and she rallies them. In the name of God, in the name of France, fight, fight for your country, fight, fight to restore France and Orléans to God's order. And those Armagnac forces are filled with a faith and a fighting fervour they've never felt before and they surge forward. And the English hear her as well and they wonder, has God deserted us? And they falter. But then late on the first day, Joan is injured in the shoulder. She lays in a ditch and the Armagnacs become confused. They don't know what to do. They hesitate. And the English and the Burgundians seize the moment and they push back. But then Joan stands and she yells above the battle, In the name of God, fight, fight for France, fight! And the Armagnacs push again and they surge and the English forces are fooled with self-doubt and the Armagnac forces are full of courage. And within four days, the siege of Orléans is over. The English have retreated. Joan returns to the royal court of Chinon, a hero. But she is not finished. She has a mission to rid the whole of France of the English and to see Charles the Dauphin crowned the rightful king in Reims. Reims is a town 400 kilometres north of Chinon in the middle of English-held enemy territory. And it is at the Cathedral of Reims where every king of France since Clovis, the first king of France, has been crowned and anointed with the sacred oil. And so Joan starts to try to persuade Charles to go on this journey with her. But he is as adverse to risk and danger as Joan is ready for it. Mm, I'm not so sure about this. It's a bit risky, isn't it? Why don't we just wait until we win the war? Or, or I don't know, there's an agreement made and I can go to Reims protected. But he's also deeply insecure about his position and he desperately wants to be given the legitimacy of being crowned king. So eventually, Joan, with her vision and her persuasion, convinces him and they set off on the 400-kilometre journey. And town after town after town opened their gates to Joan the Maid and her vision to see the Dauphin crowned the rightful king of France. 
and they get to Reims. And it's a small affair, but the Archbishop of Reims anoints Charles with the sacred oil, and Joan stands behind him with her banner held high, and he is crowned king. At this height in Joan's favour with the king, the king declares that Dom Remy, Joan's home village, will be exempt from taxes in perpetuity. And so for 350 years, the people of Dom Remy do not pay tax until the French Revolution. But Charles the King is still the dilly-dallying, risk-averse diplomat that he always was, and he heads back to Chinon, despite the fact that Joan wants to fight. She wants to fulfil her prophecy and rid France of the English. That is her God-given mission. That is the direction from her voices. But she must obey her king and go with him. But she is vocal about her frustrations, very vocal, and she's becoming a problem that won't quietly go away. Joan is bordering on usurping royal power and fast becoming a right royal pain in the proverbial. So they send her out to this squirmish and to chase after this renegade or to deal with this mercenary to keep her occupied and out of the court. And finally, they sent her to Compiègne. Compiègne is an Armagnac town under attack from the Burgundians. She knows what to do. It's like Orleans. Charge in, God will deliver. But this time, she is surrounded. They press in. There's no way to escape. She is yanked off her horse hard onto the ground. They stand over her and they whoop in triumph. As a knight should... Joan immediately surrenders herself to the nearest Burgundian captain. And then the English rub their hands with glee. At last we have caught the Armagnac whore, and that means that God is not on the side of the Armagnacs, but is on the side of the English and the Burgundians. And we will prove that she is a witch and a heretic, and that will prove that Charles is not the rightful king of France at all. The Armagnacs, for their part decide that the very fact that Charles has been crowned king at Reims and anointed with the sacred oil is proof positive that he is the rightful king of France. And nothing that Joan did or didn't do, nothing the English prove or don't prove, alter that fact. Charles VII did not once, then or ever, offer a ransom or enter into any negotiations for the release of the woman who turned the tide of the war against the English and saw him crowned king. So the English set out to conduct the most meticulous and rigorous trial that the Middle Ages would see. They would leave no stone unturned to make sure that everything is strictly lawful in the trial and they will prove without a shadow of a doubt that this woman is a witch and a heretic. It takes them eight months to bring this trial to a public hearing and then Joan of Arc, 19, illiterate, faces public interrogation by between 40 and 70 men. Most are double her age, All are vastly more powerful and educated than she is. They are lawyers, theologians, judges, clerics. She might be illiterate, but she is deeply grounded in her faith and articulate. In six long sessions stretched out over two weeks, they don't get from her what they want. And so they adjourn, and they decide they'll continue the hearings in her prison cell. Naturally, they can't fit 70 men in there, but they can cram about a dozen of them into that dark, dank, cold cell where she's shackled hand and foot. And there, soft and hard, cajoling and menacing, they duck and weave and trip and trick to try to break her resolve. Like hounds with the scent of fox in their nostrils, they barrage her. And finally, 
she gives them something that they seize upon. She talks of an angel walking upstairs with a crown for the king. And they all know, all those lawyers and bishops know, that visions from God are ethereal. They don't walk upstairs and they don't carry crowns. Visions like this are the work of the devil. But still they want more. They want Joan to submit to the authority of the church. And so they leave her languishing for another two weeks. And then they come back. By this stage, she's sick. She's been in prison for ten months, two months under intense interrogation. She's comforted by the voices of St. Catherine and St. Margaret. But she said way more than she ever wanted to about her visions, the voices, and her relationship with God. She's also comforted by her tunic and her doublet that are tied around her in elaborate knots to keep the groping, menacing, predatory hands of the men she is surrounded by who are her captors. She is sure God's help will come. They enter again, and the bishop demands, Will you submit to the church militant here on earth, to the Holy Mother Church in Rome? It is to the church and God victorious in heaven that I submit. It seems to me that God and the church are one in the same, and there should be no difficulty with that. Why do you make this such a difficulty? They leave and they come back again two weeks later, and this time they take her out to a room full of the implements of torture. Jagged metal teeth, beds of barbs, racks and screws. And she says, Truly, if you were to tear me limb from limb, if you were to separate my soul from my body, I would tell you no more. The next time they take her to a scaffold erected over the graves in the cemetery of Rouen, and there is the executioner and a sea of men to berate and cajole, to convince and persuade her. And finally the bishop says, You leave the church no choice but to abandon you to the secular power to be burned at the stake in the purifying fires. And a wave of terror steals through her and she speaks. I submit. I wish to obey the church and her judges. And they fall about themselves, slathering at the mouth to get her to sign her abjuration, her confession, which will result in her perpetual incarceration. They take her back to her cell. She bows her head. They shave her hair. They give her women's clothes. But three days later, the judges are called back, and they come and she's agitated, she's distressed, but they see none of that. All they see is that she is back in men's clothes, and she says, It is only right and proper that I wear men's clothes if I am to live among men. And what of the promise that I would have mass and I would be removed from these shackles? I would rather die than live in irons. Have you heard the voices of St. Catherine and St. Margaret? Yes! And what did they say? They said, I have done a great evil, that I have damned myself to save my life. She was declared a relapsed heretic and sentenced to burn at the stake. The next day, as she had been wanting to for so long, Brother Martin came and heard her confession, and he administered the sacrament of the Eucharist. And then they put a tall white hat on her shaved head. The hat read, Relapsed, Heretic, Apostate, Adulterer. And they put her in a cart and they jerked her through the streets of Rouen to the pyre and the marketplace. And there she endured more lectures. You, Joan the maid, have fallen. You have returned to your sin like a dog to its vomit. Hardened heretics must be separated lest their pernicious vipers lodge in the bosom of the Holy Mother Church. 
The English soldiers lifted her slender body to the stake and they tied her to it. And then they moved back and the executioner moved in and lit the pyre. Joan's eyes fixed on a crucifix that someone held high in the crowd for her, and her lips moved in ceaseless prayer. Jesus Mary, Mother of God, Jesus Mary, Mother of God, Jesus Mary, Mother of God, Jesus, 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 Jesus. They say her head slumped in unconsciousness before the flames reached her. And then, once they had, the executioner raked back the fire so that all could see and satisfy themselves that she was a woman. Joan of Arc's public life was for two years. The first year, she was a soldier the second year she was a prisoner. Her courage, her faith and vision in the face of unfathomable differences in power, in gender, rank, education, age, they'll always be extraordinary and inspiring. The power of her imagination enabled her to envision a France that was not in living memory, a France free of the invading English. And she saw clearly the means and the need to have the Dauphin crowned the rightful king of France. Her youthful, impetuous, abstinent, glorious life draws from me a desire to honour and support the willful, visionary, compelling young women of today. Unlike them, Joan did not have the luxury of time and maturing. Her sins cascaded around her. She heard voices. She fought like a soldier. She dressed like a man. She cowed before no one. But most heinous of all, she refused to submit to the church and claimed for herself direct communication with God. A particularly pagan view of the divine. The Roman Catholic Church spent the next 400 years in trials and torture, persecution and murder, mostly directed at women, to make sure that no one else claimed a direct line to God. And the legacy of that violence over all those years is still with us today. But so too is the legacy of the story of Joan of Arc. Thanks for listening to Tide to the Moon. If you like this podcast, I would be thrilled if you would rate and review it on iTunes or wherever you listen and tell other people about it. And if you have any ideas, suggestions, requests, comments or feedback, I would absolutely love to hear from you. You can find the show notes and contact details at storyground.com.au and this is also where you can support the work of independent storytellers like me, by buying me a coffee, either as a one-off donation or on an ongoing basis. The theme music for this podcast is by Dania from Audio Jungle. The podcast is a production of Storyground and me, Kate Lawrence, and is made on the traditional lands of the Gunung Wilhelm at the foot of Mount Macedon, 65 kilometres northwest of Melbourne. <laughs>